A few years ago when I was working on my PhD thesis, I came across an old 19th century treatise on solitude by William Alger. Um, it took me about a year. I couldn't find a clean copy, so I spent all, about a year um, going through all of the old um, scans that I could find of the book and retyping it out and then editing it so that I could republish it, mostly because I wanted this book to be out and available um, because I it was full of such good content and such great writing. So it has that stilted, flowery, over-the-top language that's common with 19th century writers, which made it obscenely dense and difficult to parse out the meaning. But there's also some really, really good stuff in there about what it means to be a creative person, um, specifically what solitude can do for artists and creative types. But also it had some points that I'd never really seen anywhere else about how to get over creative anxiety. So that's mostly what I'm going to talk about in this video. It's kind of relevant. Um, I'm on self-quarantine here. You might be as well. I've seen a lot of memes about how, you know, the quarantine for extroverts might sound terrible, but introverts or writers maybe don't even have to change their lifestyle very much. That's certainly true for me. Um, I'm staying in more than usual, but it doesn't really affect my normal life very much. But what can change a little bit um, is the levels of anxiety, which is already a problem for creative professionals because it's difficult to spend the time making the work if you don't know whether or not it's going to succeed. Um, it's usually during the production stage when you start off making something new, you get that excitement where you're happy to be building something, um, especially with writing, when you're writing the first draft. I'm a more of a drafter, uh, pants, sorry. I'm more of a plotter than a drafter or a pantser. So, Writing the first draft is difficult for me, but when I get into it, it's also very, very satisfying because you're putting words on the page. Um, with editing, it can all, all often feel like you're revising the same thing, you know, for months at a time, going through the same draft over and over again, um, which is really frustrating, especially when, you know, you don't know if it's worth the time. Um, the book that I just edited, I'm working with a co-writer with, and it's very good. I'm really excited and proud of it, but, um, you know, it's the third book in a trilogy. We'll probably make, like, long term, it'll make um, some money. And when I put out enough content, the reason that I value working on my own books is because when I have enough content, I am sure that I'll start to make some money back. But in the beginning, when we don't have very much content, I'm basically working for free. Um, which is what I've been doing for most of the last year, working for free, trying to put out a bunch of books um, which aren't necessarily earning a return yet. So it can get difficult and frustrating to be writing and publishing, especially when you have put some books out and you're not seeing a return on the investment. But anyway, I'm making this video to try to go through The Genius of Solitude, which is this treatise um, that I published. It is available on Amazon, but it's very dense and very heavy. So I also have a blog post up on creativity.com, which kind of summarizes the main points. That's what I'm going to try to go through in this video. I wish um, I was more of a speaker. I wish I had a really poetic, powerful voice. I don't. I'm not actually very good at speaking, which is why my voice will probably start cracking. I'm not going to do this justice at all because the language is really beautiful. Um, I do recommend you get the book or go to the blog post um, and actually read it because it might make more sense. But I'm going to try to go through it. At least I'm going through the blog post I've got on creativity to try, kind of highlight the main powerful points about what it means to be a creative professional in a way that reduces anxiety and gives you more confidence and more purpose. I also plan to put some of this stuff into a new short book on creative confidence, um, which I've outlined but I haven't worked on yet. Hopefully during this quarantine period, which will last at least two weeks, but possibly two months or more, um, I will finish a lot of the nonfiction projects that I have started. I've been doing pretty good with fiction and I'm, I'm getting organized and trying to finish up a lot of my fiction series, um, which is great because I can make income from those. But I also have a pretty big audience of other authors who I want to be providing value and content for. So I have some really exciting nonfiction projects that I haven't been working on in many years that I hope 
um, I will have some time to spend on this year. So this is one thing that I put out. It doesn't sell at all. It doesn't really have any reviews on Amazon, but that's mostly just because it's like a, a very dense treatise, um, which will take a long time to read and may not really give the value. It's one of those things where I've made this, I might make another video later today talking about literary versus um, commercial fiction, but the definition I think of literary fiction is that it's difficult to read, but it feels more satisfying because you understand how difficult to read it was. So you can read it, it's hard, but once you've dug through to understand and get the meaning, like you, with literary fiction, you have to invest the time to get the meaning, um, which is more of a risk. So you have to really trust that it's a good book to work hard enough to get the meaning. That's the difference between commercial fiction where you just read it for fun, you don't really have to work that hard. Um, this is definitely a hard book, but I think it's worth reading because the language is beautiful and because there are some deep insights. But even if you don't read the book, I hope that in this brief video, which is already at six minutes, um, I'll introduce you to some fascinating insights on the creative lifestyle. So here's the first quote. Creative art demands the service of a mind and heart heroically fashioned to infuse faith in the whispers of the lo lonely muse while the whole world seems adverse to desert. Basically, it's saying with creative art, you have to focus on producing the thing that matters, even if it seems like the world doesn't care or the world isn't paying you attention. That's kind of the first bit of conflict because you are hopefully determined to provide value to the world, but while you're working on it, you don't know if it's ever gonna be good enough, you don't know if people are actually gonna like it. Um, I think that's where the source of a lot of creative anxiety comes from. So it's also really interesting, um, William Audrey was writing this 150 years ago when there was already a lot of development and culture had changed um, to the extent that there was a shorter feedback loop. So when he published something, he knew that, um, you know, it would show up in the newspapers, he would get critics right away. It was impossible to just go into his cave and do the work um, without thinking about the reception. So he writes, now by means of literature, newspaper, telegraphs, interlacing ties of business, travel, kindred friendships, innumerable mutual interests, a sensitive genius lives constantly, as it were, in the ideal presence of all humanity. Public opinion is a reality as solid to him as the globe, its phenomena as influential as sunshine and darkness. And what he's basically saying is that it's hard for him to do the work without worrying about what other people are gonna say about it. Um, this is a pretty common thing for artists and creatives to deal with. And a lot of people really love the book, The War of Art by Stephen Pressfield because it addresses this issue. It basically says, don't worry about what other people are gonna think about it, your job is to do the work. Um, and the problem with that advice is that a lot of artists and creative people are producing work that doesn't provide value, that doesn't matter because it doesn't resonate emotionally with other people. Um, if you want to make a living as an artist, and even if you just wanna be a good artist, I think real art has an impact, which is communal. Um, just because you think it's good, just because you have this great big purpose or agenda or meaning doesn't mean anybody else is going to like it. And if nobody else appreciates what you're doing, not only do you not deserve to get paid for it, um, but you aren't really providing real art. You aren't really creating art that matters. So I prefer to understand my audience first and try to surprise and delight them by knowing what they like and expect especially with writing. Um, someone asked recently on, on Facebook something about literary fiction, and they said something like, well, what about all those famous, you know, famous books of literature that didn't follow the rules, that didn't follow a template or a style, that weren't written to be commercial? Um, on the one hand, a lot of classic literature was written to sell. It was written by authors to make money, um, at least more than half of all the famous novels you've ever heard of, 
and those ones that didn't make money, the authors were devastated that nobody wanted to read their works. Um, so it's not true that famous writers created in a void for the pure art and didn't care about reception. Um, they were often very sensitive. They were often impoverished. If they didn't, you know, sell out their, their gallery or sell their, their books, um, that was a problem. Some of them were more commercial than others. Some of them were more better at business than others, but none of them completely rejected um, the reception of their work, except potentially if you get into the romantics and the 19th century um, artists, which is what like creative, modern creatives really love that modernist period because those, I'm getting off topic, but um, during the early 20th century or the late 19th century, famous creative people for like two, 2000 years, art was following a pattern. You had to apply to get an art school. You had to learn your skills. You had to become very good. You had to become the best because art was measured a certain way. Um, and then there was a huge break because they'd already explored that avenue, avenue to, the, to the end. And it became more popular not to worry about craft or how long it took you or how good you were at your work. And it became more about the fleeting, impressionistic, um, capturing the moment, which meant it didn't really matter how, fat, how long it took you or how good you were skill-wise, um, you could still produce work that mattered. And so you had all these um, really beautiful poetry like Rilke, which was talking about how, you know, real art doesn't have an audience. Real art is all about how you feel. That's what a lot of modern creatives resonate with and identify with because, you know, the marketing is really scary and they want to believe it's more fun to just do the work and not care about whether or not anybody likes it, um, which is absolutely true. It does help you get over the creative anxiety, but when you finish the work that nobody likes and you can't sell it, you know, it doesn't matter if you have less anxiety when you do the work because it's all going to come back when you finish the work and you can't sell the book. So that's kind of my point here. Um, I got way off topic, but basically William Aldrich was already aware of a shortened feedback loop in his time where um, he was worrying more about the work he was producing because he knew, knew and was afraid of what people were going to say about it. He says, Probably no previous age was so rife as the present in interior discords, baffled longings, vast and vague sentiments whose indeterminateness is generating is a generating source of misery. Probably there were never before so many restless and weary aspirants out of tune with their neighbors, dissatisfied with their lot, unsettled in their faith, morbidly sensitive, sad, and solitary. Um, so he's writing that about 150 years ago. He could never have predicted, you know, the modern times, what we'd be facing right now. Um, it's pretty easy to argue, not only has that feedback loop um, shortened, because now, you know, you can produce something and immediately put it out online and get immediate feedback, even if you're just writing a short chapter, you can be getting feedback um, immediately. But also, despite the increased connectivity with um, the online culture and world, you could argue that more people are more dissatisfied because comparison values, when we're looking at Instagram, we see other people that appear more successful and more happy, um, but also more sensitive, sad, and solitary because despite being more connected online, most of us live increasing lives um, of solitude. So we live in a really interesting place where I think his work especially resonates with a lot of the challenges that we go through as creatives. He also says the endless multiplicity of competition in modern society at every point a prize, at every point a glass, tends to force us in inordin inordinately on our own notice. If we could but break, break the, if we could but gaze at the prize alone and break or blink the glass. So basically, um, not only is there increased competition with other creatives, but also there's this reflexivity where everywhere you look, you see a mirror that's reflecting back on you. So it's difficult to focus on the creative work when you're so wrapped up in introspection um, and society's judgment or gaze. 
So that's what he's talking about. Um, I think that's a common, that's basically the source of creative anxiety or one of the sources of creative anxiety is that kind of introspection um, and doubt, which is all kind of the preface for why William Alger decided to write this book on solitude. He says, to make a true estimate of what the trouble is with these victims of self-love and the social struggle, to give them sanitary directions explaining the causes of their wounds and the best curative treatment we cannot but think will be a service of a special timeliness. Um, which, as a preface to the book, is very good. He's saying this is the problem, creative people are anxious for these reasons, and now the book is going to try to dig into that problem and prescribe some kind of a remedy. I think the book actually sort of fails. It. He goes through, um, and it's amazing, this was written 150 years ago without Google search, so he's basically reading all the books and trying to pull together any reference to the term solitude um, from other famous writers or philosophers and bring it all together into one treatise. He sort of fails at meeting his own goal, but there, after reading the book a few times and really going in deep, I was able to pull out some of that curative treatment that he was striving for. So that's what I'm going to talk about um, for the rest of this video. A lot of the book is just talking about other original thinkers, and his main point is that if you want to be original, you are necessarily going beyond the accepted social viewpoint of your subject, um, which means, by definition, originality is always going to be a solitary pursuit. He says, originality may seek widely and long, but in vain for the equal love it desires. So originality is almost necessarily a solitary position, but creative souls will always seek to find somebody else who they can share their knowledge with or their insights with, um, but it will be difficult to find someone else on the same playing field because you are always, if you dig into that original um, insight, you're always gonna be an outcast, um, which may feel, I think that's kind of typical for someone who is trying to push the boundaries of their creative art. Um, I'm actually pretty supportive of commercial art. I think you should be making commercial art on purpose. There are rules to commercial art. Um, so when I write fiction, for example, I'm not necessarily trying to be an original. I'm trying to be the best novel writer for my audience. Um, or at least comparable to the other books that they're already um, reading. So I have found a really great community of other writers because as long as we agree on the shared standpoint that we are trying to write good books to make our readers happy, we have a lot in common. Um, those writers who are determined not to pander to the common denominator or their audience or worry about the reception of their work um, and they think they're creating, you know, true genius level out of the box books, those are the ones that are going to have a harder time of connecting with uh, a community. William Alger writes, the most royal souls of the race who so truly love and honor their fellow man as to sacrifice everything selfish for their good are either feared as dangerous innovators and persecuted as wicked heretics or neglected to die of want and heartbreak. This is a very romantic view of artistic production, so I would be careful if this resonates with you because there's this idea that if I create the work by not caring about money, by not caring about personal reward, um, then I'm suffering for my art. And if I suffer for my art, it's going to be higher quality and the audience is going to recognize the genius. Um, like the harder you work, the harder, the more you suffer for your work, the better quality it's gonna be. That's not actually true. It almost never plays out um, in the marketplace, but especially in the contemporary marketplace where the feedback loop is so much shorter. I don't think you necessarily need to suffer for your art. It is difficult um, to create good work, even if you're trying to create commercial fiction or commercial art, but I don't think isolation is necessary and I don't think suffering or loneliness um, is necessary. William writes, nothing can be more blessedly solacing and sedative for the overwrite champion of the arena 
than contemplation of the inner drama of those delicate and listening minds, those deep and dreamy hearts who pass their days in an ideal sphere detached from their intoxicate, intoxicating prizes of outward life, far from the bewildering roar of the world. So he's basically setting up as the solution for solitude. If you are a, a solitary artist struggling for your art, it can feel good to read about other famous failed artists who also lived in solitude and suffered for their art. Um, and it can, he's absolutely right. It can feel like, well, I must be doing the right thing. If I'm suffering, if nobody's appreciating my work, if I feel lonely, then I must be doing the right thing. And this is necessary to produce a great work. Um, and it can feel good to read about other struggling artists and put yourself in the same box with them and feel like, you know, you are just part of this grand tradition of solitary suffering. Um, but I don't think it's actually true in the same way today as it was 150 years ago. And even if it does feel good, that doesn't necessarily mean you are creating art that matters, art that resonates with your audience. But his next three points, I really think are pretty insightful. These are the three orders of wretchedness. So these are the three main anxieties or the sources for creative fear or creative anxiety um, that most artists and authors will face. And so I'm going to read through these three things and then see if we can talk about, you know, how to get over them, how to defeat the anxiety. So the first order of wretchedness is the idea that I have nothing to live for. Um, and this is about finding meaning or purpose. I've heard it said, like, if you don't care about your work, if you don't have passion or enjoy working on your work, um, readers aren't going to enjoy it either, which is why some people feel like they could never write commercial fiction, they could never write, you know, to market, because if they don't enjoy it, if they don't feel that it's worthwhile, if they feel like they're just doing it for the money, um, you know, they take away the personal satisfaction. And without that, they feel like the work will be inferior. It is true that if you don't believe in your work, it's going to be difficult to finish it. You do have to feel like what you're doing is worthwhile, and this can be difficult sometimes. Um, Goethe has this quote, Goethe, um, a German philosopher, wouldst thou lead a happy life on earth, thou must then clothe the world with worth, which just means if you want to be happy, you have to find meaning, even if you are deciding to find meaning. Um, and this can be difficult if you really get self-reflexive, if you're feeling depression or anxiety, it can be easy to feel like, what does this even matter? Why would my novel possibly matter, you know, to the world? Um, is what I'm doing worth the time, especially if you're not making money from your books or the books haven't been successful yet? Um, you can feel like, you know, why invest all the time to do it if you're not getting paid or if nobody else enjoys the work? So according to Alger, the true zest of life is an absor absorbing object. He says, a man with a mighty purpose finds room and leisure and invitations in it for his imagination to work and react until all centers of association, the batteries of his mind, are charged with magnetic ideas. So it can be really exciting when you're writing a book because you're fully occupying your brain. Um, writing a book is one of the hardest things I think it's possible to do, and it can be really cool when you're writing a book, the way that book writing typically works is that it's a series of problem solving. So you write it up to a point and then you have a plot hole or you have a problem and you have to figure out how to solve that problem. Um, and often the solution doesn't come to you right away, but while you're out walking or while you're in the shower or whatever, you suddenly get this epiphany. Your brain works subconsciously to fill in the gaps of your narrative, um, which is an incredibly rewarding experience. It really feels like you know, it's not just you writing the book, but somehow the universe is magically filling in the blanks um, to help you produce the work, which can make it feel like because you are getting this unimaginable, um, unexplainable solution from the universe, it can feel like, you know, the magic is happening. You don't know how the work is getting done, but somehow, you know, this book must be meaningful because my brain is working in this miraculous way. So it can feel 
meaningful to write books that way, which is often why pantsers, people who don't plot, feel that it's more enjoyable um, to write books without having a structure. And there was something in, in a Times article about creativity a few years ago that was something like there are two methods of creativity. The one hand, you map it all out yourself and do the work and fill it in. The other hand, excuse me, on the other hand, you just kind of start writing. You don't know where you're going and it just magically writes itself, um, which can be more difficult, but feel more, well, it can feel more rewarding and it can be easier for some people. Some people are more naturally gifted to the pantsing without an outline. They find outlines really difficult. Um, I personally find that outlining can help me to finish a higher quality book faster and easier with much less brutal revisions necessary. Um, the challenge is if you pants a book, you know, you end up with this really messy broken manuscript and then it's impossible to go back and fix because you don't even know how you ended up with it in the first place. It can also give you an, an unexpected um, and unreliable expectation of success because you feel like the universe gifted me this miraculous book. So there must be a reason, a purpose, you know, it must go on to sell millions of copies. Um, and there's a disconnect between, you know, this book wasn't written to formula. It doesn't do any of the things that a typical book or novel should do. Um, readers don't like it. It's not selling. I've seen authors invest everything in a book that doesn't sell because they never figured out how to make the book resonate with a particular audience. He also writes that happiness is a successful pursuit of an aim. So even if life seems meaningless, you, meaningless, you need to choose something, a project, um, a fulfilling, absorbing object to work on to find happiness. You have to discover your own meaning by trying to do something difficult and producing creative work um, that matters at least to you and hopefully matters to other people as well. So that's the first challenge um, of the first wretched uh, state of wretchedness or whatever, order of wretchedness. Um, the first one is, you know, it can feel meaningless. You have to decide that your work has meaning, but um, it can be difficult to choose what's a meaningful project. So I've had a lot of people ask me like, I have all these ideas. How do I decide what's going to be the most successful? How do I decide what to put all my um, attention on? Is it worth spending hundreds of hours writing this book um, as opposed to some other book? This is the place where market research can really be a huge benefit. Um, if you use a tool like KDP Rocket or K Klytics, um, which is a tool that kind of analyzes the market and tells you what's already popular, um, it can make a huge difference. The book, the success of your book is, is more about the market than it is about the book that you've written or the quality of the book. Um, so for example, I know that vampires sell more than mermaids. It's more competitive, but also has a much more in-demand market, a hungrier audience. Um, so I could choose to write a mermaid fantasy book or a vampire fantasy book. And even if those two books are equal of, of equal quality, um, one will get more reviews and sell better because of the situation of the market, because of what the market is looking for. Um, so the second point, the second order of wretchedness is how to choose a fulfilling object to focus all your time on. And he calls this, if I could wish I could do. So the first one was going back a little bit. I have nothing for, to live for. You need to find a creative project that has meaning. The second one is if I could wish I could do. It's difficult to choose a creative pro project that has meaning. Um, it, if you could wish for success, if you were excited about a goal, then you could do the work. But what if nothing is exciting? What if you don't know um, what's going to be popular or what's going to be successful and you are afraid of starting or investing a ton of time into a project if it's not going to be successful? So this is the second one, if I could wish I could do. He says, the greater the number of interests a man carries and the greater the number of external relations he sustains, the more delicate and arduous becomes the problem of harmonizing them, fulfilling his duties, and satisfying his desires. Um, it's difficult to choose one project, especially if you have lots of ideas, you like getting started, maybe you like doing the outline, um, but it's difficult for you to sit down 
and do the work. Writing a novel is very difficult, then editing it and revising it is also difficult. It takes a really long time. It can be easy to get shiny object syndrome and go on to the next project without ever finishing that first one. I have friends who do NaNoWriMo every year and they have like 10 completed first drafts, but they've never finished a book because for whatever reason, they're more invested in the process of writing, but not finishing the work and getting it out there. Um, so the first one is just how do you find a meaningful project? The second one is how do you decide between different exciting projects and choosing one project that you can really focus on for an extended period of time. And this is where following your passion comes in. Um, I typically don't like that phrase, follow your passion. I don't think it's good advice. Um, embrace your bliss or chase your bliss is a little bit better. Basically, you do need to be excited and enthusiastic about your work or else you'll give up when it gets difficult. Writing is difficult. It's not supposed to be fun all the time. This is why I think it's dangerous advice. A lot of authors, you know, it stops being fun so they give up or they go into another project because they feel like if it's not fun, why even do it? Um, that's why I believe you should consider the market. You should do your research and kind of get at least a little bit of an estimate about whether or not this project will be profitable. Um, at least to cover your costs. I've said in the past, and it's true that writing is a difficult way to make money. There is money to be made in writing. You can make a living as an author, but it's not easy and you have to make the right decisions. You have to decide that you intend to make money with your books by writing commercial books, which are just books that other people are going to enjoy. Um, if you don't know what to do. It's better to be doing something than nothing. So don't be stuck with paralysis. And sometimes you have to do the wrong thing to learn the insights that you need to do the right thing. So there's no real such thing as um, failure as long as you're learning, although you don't really want to fail for 10 years writing the wrong kind of books before you finally understand it's okay to write to market or write books that, that other people like. Um, but you do also need some bliss or some passion to get you through the hard patches where the work gets difficult. William Alger writes, force enough is wasted in the sterile chatter of conceited criticism to produce much of permanent worth. If it were converted into creative meditation, we have super abundant impulse, but little patience. It is all come and go, but no stay. He also says, much of my time is thrown away in pursuing the phantoms of a disordered imagination. So you do need to choose um, one project that you can focus on to get done. I also think it's a really good idea to write what I've called taster novels or teasers. Instead of writing a novel or instead of, for example, finishing a completed trilogy so that you can rapid release and then discovering that, you know, you made all your mistakes with that first launch, um, I think it's better to write 10 or 20,000 words of a potential story and get it out there and get feedback on it, or even the first couple chapters, because if nobody likes your first couple chapters, and if you can't sell, for example, if you put out, you know, a perma-free book with 10,000 words, it's the first three chapters of a story. If you can't get anybody to download that for free, you're never going to get able, you're never going to get anybody to pay to read that story. So you already need a good cover. You already need a great blurb or description of the project. Um, by doing your market research, by learning how to write sales copy so that you can even get the free downloads for your trial um, and get some feedback to, to see if this is something worth considering. What I see a lot of people doing is they write a finished trilogy, but it doesn't sell because the blurb isn't any good, the cover's no good, um, and the first couple chapters don't hook you in. So if the first couple chapters don't work and you've written two or 300,000 words for your trilogy, that's a wasted effort because if you can't get the first couple chapters right, none of the rest of it matters. Plus you probably, if you didn't study story architecture or, or craft, you've probably written two or 300 words, two or 300,000 words of content that doesn't have enough conflict or intrigue or plotting to pull people into the story, um, which means it is kind of a wasted effort. So you do need to learn enough about your craft to get it reasonably right the first time. On the other hand, it's true that you may need to write a million words of crap before you learn how to write high quality fiction or nonfiction. Um, you do sometimes need to make the mistakes 
to learn from your mistakes. On the other hand, when you're writing to market, you can not make those mistakes. You can go through my resources and figure out how to plan your book intentionally and have a pretty solid book the first time around once you've done the first draft. So the third order of wretchedness is why should I wish I could not do? Um, and I'm going to go back and summarize these again one more time really quickly. So number one is I have nothing to live for. You have to decide that some creative pursuit is worth your attention and worth the time. Um, I think you can be thinking about the commercial aspects of your work. I think you can be thinking about building your audience and you can write a good book deliberately by studying craft and story architecture. Um, number two is if I could wish I could do, that's just about deciding which of your many projects is the most likely to be commercially viable or the most likely to be successful. Um, you want to think about what type of author do you want to build your platform around. It's very difficult to be an author if you have lots of different content. I personally write young adult fantasy, um, which is not really a genre. So I can write sci-fi and fantasy together and I have different kinds of books, but all of my young adult books have the same sort of style and structure um, and appeal to the same audience. That's really what it's all about. And my nonfiction stuff is completely separated under a different pen name um, because it's a different audience and I don't want to mix those two things up. So you do need to decide what kind of books do you enjoy writing that also have commercial appeal? Um, what kind of author brand? Whoops, hold on a second. What kind of author brand do you want to um, focus on building? Those are the projects that you really want to invest in. On the other hand, it may be difficult to choose until you put out some fiction. So if you have lots of ideas, um, like I said, maybe write, maybe don't write you know, three different trilogies, but maybe write the first three chapters of three different trilogy trilogies and see which one is easiest to sell and promote. Um, that might be the one that you focus on. So that's If I Wish I Could Do. It's about making a decision about what to pursue. The third one is Why Should I Wish I Could Not Do? And this is about the disparity between your skill level. You, maybe you have an idea for what you want to produce, but you realize in the process you are not good enough to produce the content, um, which is very difficult and very frustrating, but it's also completely normal. You need to fail so that you learn how to get better. Um, it's normal to write bad books first and to get better with time. Um, we're in the weird position now where you can write a bad first book and put it out there. You could even be moderately successful with a bad book if it's sold well and there's a lot of demand for it. Um, you can sell a bad book with great sales copy, great cover, great blurb, and then get the negative reviews later that you know, you're making some money until the negative reviews come in and tell you what you did wrong and why readers aren't enjoying it. So William says, unhappiness results when the imagination outruns the heart. It's a really cool quote, um, but basically when you, and you've seen these memes on Facebook and everything, like what I imagine the first draft to be, what the first draft actually looks like, um, Always when you're painting or writing, it's difficult to produce a product that lives up to your conception in your mind because you need to really improve your skill level and it takes a lot of time and dedication um, to polish the work to make it good enough. Um, it's difficult, which is why a lot of people give up or get frustrated or they think like, I'm not cut out to be an artist or a writer because I'm not good enough. The good news is, um, these are creative skills that can be learned. When you're talking about craft, whether in painting or in writing, um, it's a learnable skill. Nobody is born with an innate skill for writing. You can get better at this if you want to, but it does take time and determination. So he continues, when great faculties have no correspondent desires to animate and use them, also when great energies have no adequate motivations and guides. So there's a disconnect between um, being able to produce what you want to produce or having the skills but having no exciting ideas um, that get you to do the work. It has to be kind of a balance of both. Happiness is the successful pursuit of an aim, not necessarily the completion. Um, I actually find when you finish a work 
there's a down period where you're likely to get depressed or frustrated because you've spent so much time and energy and effort um, putting it into this work. When you finally finish, it can be a letdown. You can feel drained or exhausted. It's really easy to get depressed during that period and to wonder if it has all been worth it. William Alger says, there are the sufferings of desire deprived of power, the sufferings of power deprived of desire, the sufferings of disappointed passion baffled in its aims, and the sufferings of disenchanted passion finding nothing worthy of its efforts. Um, basically different ways you can be dissatisfied or frustrated with the work. He uses an example of another writer who says, too rich to be insensible to the wealth and lovely loveliness of the universe, too poor to be able to grasp and fix the divine shapes in solid forms of art. He was torn between aspiration and weakness, will and want. This is, I think, is the number one creative frustration or problem that people feel when they're trying to produce quality work. Um, you always feel dissatisfied with your own work. I've also seen memes on Facebook where the challenging thing about writing is that you're always getting better, so you're always more critical of your own work. So even though your books are getting better, you always feel like they are worse than before. Um, it can feel like you are never living up to your potential because as you learn more about writing, you're more aware of the mistakes that you're making. Alger also writes, he who aims at perfection going out and up in thoughts and feelings from his defects to its standards will be happy. He who aims at fame coming down in thought and feeling from his rich desires to the poor facts will be miserable. So he's basically saying, um, aim at improving your craft, don't aim at fame or fortune. I would argue that like you always want to be aiming for perfection, but of course you will never achieve it. And you need to, there was a, a phrase I learned recently in another video that was about exercise or something. Um, and he was talking about train to failure, where you need to exercise your muscles to the point where they fail and you can't do the exercise anymore. Um, you can't just keep kind of plateauing. If you want to have su successful gains, you have to challenge yourself so hard that you do what you're incapable of doing um, to the point where you fail so that you're developing the muscle and getting better. I'd be cautious against using the term perfection because even though you should aim at it, I would aim at constant improvement, not necessarily perfection. Um, I, it's also really dangerous to worry about being perfect and trying to like polish your novel to perfection and worrying about little tiny details that don't matter um, instead of getting the book out and done because that's really when you're gonna start to get the audience reception or feedback, which is the most important stuff. And so finally, those were the three orders of wretchedness, which I think are really fascinating. You can read more about them on my blog. I'll link down below. Um, but he also, getting back to the point on solitude, says there's kind of a coming and going point where you go to do the work in solitude, but you come back um, to give your value back to society. If you're creating high quality work in solitude, but you're not sharing it with others, then your work is always going to be inferior. It's not gonna be the true um, relevant art that really matters. He says, he deserved not to be born who thinks he was born for himself alone. So it's not enough just to do what you want for yourself. Um, he says, the true destiny of man, and I will say, he was written 150 years ago, so he's using all the male um, pronouns. The true destiny of man is the fruition of the functions of his being the purest and fullest exercise of his fac faculties and in their due order in internal unity and in external harmony. So it really does focus on, um, it's not just about you, it's about the relationships that your work is building, how it resonates with other people. He says, if you can find no peer to travel with you, then walk cheerfully on alone, your goal before the world behind, better alone with your own heart than with a crowd of babblers. Um, also, solitude is what we make it. Its influence on us de depends on the character we carry into it. Its vagueness ungirds and empties an aimless soul. So there's a, um, there's a point to solitude and you do need to go into the solitude with a certain intention. You do need to face your own solitude bravely by determining to create work that you're excited about but which also has value to the world. And then you need to come back into the world and share your value um, in a way that improves the world for other people. 
I hope this video was a little bit interesting. I know that talking through, I feel like this is poetry. It really needs to be read by somebody with a deeper voice or a more resonant voice or something. Um, but you can read the blog post to get more quotes from this book and kind of a more wrap up of, of what I think this book actually means. I'm gonna try to paraphrase a lot of it into this book on creative confidence I'm working on. Um, and the full book, if you want a, a literary challenge, if you've got some time to you know, dig into the philosophy of creative solitude. Um, the book is up on Amazon. It's pretty awesome, but difficult. So I'll leave that for you. Um, I hope if you're self-quarantine, self-quarantining, um, you do take some time to focus not only on getting some valuable work done, but also identifying what kind of work you need to be doing um, what's the important work that only you can can give birth to, um, how you're going to impact the world in your own unique way, and some of that kind of stuff. Thanks, bye-bye.